It's the result of an experiment designed to predict the future of mankind in the deliberate effort to alter that destiny. Driven by one man's passion to preserve the ways of the old masters and pass them on to the next generation. A mouse versus the machine, a machine versus the mouse. Hi, I'm Dan Larson, and this is the history of The Secret of Nim. Thank you to Athletic Greens for sponsoring this video. Click the link in the description below to place your order and receive a free gift today. Athletic Greens is on a mission to empower you to take ownership of your health with a comprehensive and convenient daily nutrition that includes 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole foods sourced ingredients made for just about everybody. Just about every body. Because when you own your health, you own your day. AG1 is lifestyle friendly. Whether you eat keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, or gluten-free, it packs energy and endurance with nutrients and phytonutrients that support and sustain healthy energy levels, which supports training regimens and performance. Athletic Greens contains quality, real ingredients, not a bunch of filler, and that's where the value is coming from. And that's where the flavor comes from. Personally, I think it leans cocoa. But if the flavor is too green for you, mix it with orange juice, mix it with pineapple juice, add some more water, drink it as cold as possible. Your body will thank you for it. Click the link in the description below to get a one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D3, K2, and five travel packs free with your first purchase. You can't put a price tag on your own health. Thank you again to Athletic Greens. The Secret of Nim is an animated feature film released in 1982 by Don Bluth Productions. In general, it's about talking farm animals whose lives are threatened by their coexistence with humans. In specific, it's rats with genetically enhanced intelligence, the result of coexistence with humans. Mrs. Brisby, widowed by the recent death of her husband Jonathan, is desperately trying to prepare for moving day while simultaneously dealing with her youngest child Timothy having contracted pneumonia. Moving day is when the humans start plowing season on the farm and everything in the fields, including her cinder block house, is in danger of being destroyed. Pneumonia is dangerous, but not necessarily deadly as long as Timothy can be kept warm, rested, and safe. The kind of total relocation that moving day would require is impossible under these conditions. It would likely mean Timothy's death. Mrs. Brisby seeks out the counsel of the great owl at the risk of her own safety, you know, because owls eat mice. But it turns out that her recently deceased husband, Jonathan, made many friends in his lifetime, the great owl being one of them. The great owl's advice to seek out Nicodemus and the rats in the rosebush gives her hope. Perhaps she might be able to save her son and find a way to keep her whole family safe. But these are no ordinary rats. They have intelligence and abilities beyond that of ordinary rats. They are the rats of Nim, genetically engineered to be smarter and stronger, to live longer and experience life beyond the basic needs of hunger and shelter. They can read and understand complex machines. They can utilize electricity. Some of the rats want to live a life of independence away from the humans as more than just common rats. Others want to remain secure in the knowledge that as long as humans are around, they can steal whatever they need. Trapped in a civil conflict between the coalitions of genetically engineered rats, Mrs. Brisby must find a way to convince them to help her, or perhaps unlock the secret of the jeweled amulet given to her by Nicodemus. What other secrets have yet to be revealed by the Rats of Nim? The Secret of Nim is an adaptation of the 1971 book Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim, written by Robert C. O'Brien. It won a Lewis Carroll Shelf Award, a Newbery Medal, a Mark Twain Award, and was the subject of a very half-assed book report I did in fourth grade. Robert C. O'Brien is the pen name of Robert Leslie Carroll Conley. His contract with National Geographic, where he was an editor, prevented him from writing under his own name, so he adopted the O'Brien moniker. He published his first novel in 1968 called The Silver Crown. Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim was Conley's second book, published in 1971. It was at least partially inspired by experiments conducted on rats and mice at the National Institute of Mental Health by John B. Calhoun. Calhoun was at the forefront of research throughout the 50s, 60s, and 70s that considered the social, environmental, and economic implications of overpopulation, particularly the extreme ways that behaviors can change as the draw on necessities like food and shelter are unnaturally strained due to social hierarchies. 
Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim follows Mrs. Frisbee's desperation to protect her family as moving day approaches just as her youngest son Timothy has contracted pneumonia. Advised by the Great Owl, a friend to her recently deceased husband Jonathan, she reaches out to a group of rats who escaped from experiments being conducted on them at the National Institute of Mental Health. The Rats of Nim are genetically engineered to be stronger, smarter, and live longer. Mrs. Frisbee will need their knowledge and understanding of human technology, engineering, and teamwork in order to move her house because there are no such thing as magic amulets. Walt Disney Studio was offered the rights to Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim in 1972, at which time they declined. Conley passed away in 1973. His daughter, Jane Leslie Conley, published two more books in the Rats of Nim canon, Raxo and the Rats of Nim in 1986, and R.T. Margaret and the Rats of Nim in 1990. Don Bluth joined Walt Disney Studios in 1955 as an assistant to animator John Lounsbury. Lounsbury was one of Disney's revered nine old men, the core animators who had been with Disney since the 20s and 30s. Two years later, in 1957, Bluth left Disney because it was, as he put it, kind of boring. Bluth moved to Argentina for two years of mission work, then returned to the U.S., where he spent the next several years producing Broadway musical performances and getting a degree in English literature from Brigham Young University. In 1967, he went back to animation, working for Filmation, on shows like The Archie Show and Sabrina the Teenage Witch. And in 1971, he went back to Disney where he worked on 1973's Robin Hood and 1974's Winnie the Pooh and Tigger 2. Around 1975, Bluth started development on an independent animated film project called Banjo the Woodpile Cat. Banjo was produced by Bluth and several other Disney animators, including Gary Goldman, in their free time on nights and weekends working out of Bluth's garage because it was in no way associated with Disney. Bluth began the project out of concern that the ways of the nine old men, the wisdom and magic of classic animation, were being lost. Disney, he thought, was too concerned with the bottom line, faster turnaround times, lower costs, greater profits, all of this on the backs of the animators, and at the expense of the art. Banjo the Woodpile Cat was inspired by Bluth's time as a child living on a farm with a cat who lived in a woodpile. That cat was Banjo the Woodpile Cat. By 1977, Bluth was a directing animator on The Rescuers, no longer an assistant to the nine old men. At some point during Bluth's time at Disney, another Disney writer and artist, Ken Anderson, brought Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim to Bluth's attention, suggesting that it would make for an excellent film. Bluth agreed and brought the idea of Mrs. Frisbee as a possible project to Disney Animation director Wolfgang Wooly Reitherman, who likely sneered as he said, quote, We've already got a mouse, and we've done a mouse movie. That mouse was Mickey the Mouse. In 1979, Bluth was hoping to sell Banjo the Woodpile Cat to Disney to recoup some of the cost he and others had personally invested, and ideally, finish it at Disney's animation studio instead of his garage. Banjo had served its primary purpose as a way for Bluth to train animators the way he thought they should be trained in the ways of the old masters. When he brought Banjo to Ron Miller, the president and CEO of Disney at the time, Miller declined to even view it, much less buy it, distribute it, and promote it. Bluth and the team were crushed and poor. They were beyond frustrated with Disney's direction, determined to get out of Disney's grip, but revolution was going to cost money they didn't have. Bluth was able to secure the funding needed to complete Banjo the Woodpile Cat, and, as luck would have it, Jim Stewart and Rich Irvine, two ex-Disney executives, owned a new company called Aurora Productions. Having heard about Bluth's frustrations, they reached out with an offer of investment to partner in the creation of a new animation studio. Anyway, it's a party, and I want the whole family there. We're having a party? No. Bluth was very receptive to the idea, and after showing them Banjo the Woodpile Cat, Aurora was confident that Don Bluth and his team were ready. Bluth still had Mrs. Frisbee in his pocket, knowing that Disney had declined it and suggested it as their first production. In September 1979, Don Bluth and Gary Goldman told the Banjo team that they were, quote, taking our short and leaving. We're not asking you to leave, but you are welcome if you want to come with us. But 15 other animators did believe him, and they staged a mass exodus from Disney Animation. While it didn't kill Disney Animation, it stung quite a bit. The walkout caused nearly every production that was in progress at Disney to get pushed back, most notably the Fox and the Hound and the Black Cauldron. Black Cauldron had already been delayed more than once and was now pushed from 1981 to 1984. Don Bluth Studios began in Bluth's garage, but quickly upgraded to a proper studio space in Studio City, California. Banjo the Woodpile Cat was released in November of 1979, just a few months after the exodus from Disney. Aurora officially committed to Secret of Nim by acquiring the rights to the book and setting a budget of nearly $6 million with a 30-month production window. That was an aggressive budget and an aggressive timeline, less than Disney would have needed to make the same film at the same time. It's a classic adventure in family entertainment. 
It has wizards, villains, and heroes. I ain't scared of nothing. It's a fantasy full of adventure, dangers, and magic. Look there, right before your eyes, and beyond your wildest dreams, discover the secret of NIM. Rated G. Starts Friday, Plitt Century City, Hollywood, Hollywood, and selected theaters. After a quick side job to produce animation for the 1980s sensation Xanadu, Don Bluth and his team got to work on Nim. Several potential angles to adapt the book were considered, but Bluth pushed for a focus on Mrs. Frisbee and her children. And it was Bluth who made the call to introduce magic where none had existed previously. As he put it, quote, regarding magic, we really believe that animation calls for some magic to give it a special, fantastic quality. That applied to characters within the story like Nicodemus, originally a wizened old rat, now an actual sorcerer, the red amulet or sparkly as Jeremy the Crow calls it, an essential MacGuffin. Other characters are given greater significance or downplayed where it was best serving the narrative. Jenner in the book is a traitor who is almost never seen. In the movie he is a primary antagonist responsible for one of the most critical and traumatic scenes in the film, a more dramatic depiction of the discord within the community of rats. The title was changed from Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim to the secret of Nim because the word rats didn't test well, but the most significant change from book to film was the name of the main character. Aurora attempted to secure a trademark waiver for the name Frisbee from Whammo due to a potential conflict with one of their products. That product was the Frisbee. Here's the candy bar. Oh, no. I'm withholding it. When Whammo refused, Bluth and company opted to change Mrs. Frisbee to Mrs. Brisby to avoid any potential future litigation. As production was already in progress, that meant fixing dialogue that had already been recorded. John Carradine, who played the Great Owl, wasn't available for the re-recording, so any mention of Brisby in his dialogue was expertly Frankenstein together from Frisbee and words he spoke that started with B. It's so well done that even if you're listening for it, it doesn't sound edited. Elizabeth Hartman played Mrs. Brisby, Dom DeLuise played Jeremy the Crow, Peter Strauss was Justin, Shannon Doherty and Will Wheaton played Mrs. Brisby's children, Teresa and Martin, respectively, and Edie McClure gets a few giggles in as the crow Miss Wright. Secret of Nim was produced in a grind from January of 1980 through 1982. Blue's goal was to go back to the methods used during the classic days of Disney animation, to utilize techniques that Disney had abandoned. It was there that animation justified itself as an art form. From rotoscoping to multipass, transparent shadows, backlit animation, and the use of color palettes that changed relevant to the lighting scenario in a given scene. Direct light, underwater, in shadow, warm, cold. Mrs. Brisby herself had 46 different color palettes. But always with an eye on the budget, the work required precision and expertise, long hours, and in many cases, no immediate financial benefit. While it was a revolutionary concept to offer animators a cut of the film's final profits, it was a risk to assume that there would be any. All under the pressure of a highly public walkout, with Bluth and Aurora staking their futures on the success of this film, with a media landscape touting the approaching release date as a matchup of two studios, the old and the new, who represented the future of animated film. You might be eating that's gonna Well, let's hope it doesn't come to that. By the end of production, Secret of Nim's budget surged almost half a million dollars. To their credit, Bluth, Goldman, and other producers took on that additional financial responsibility themselves, mortgaging their own homes to close the gap. But they pulled it off in half the time it took Disney to produce a feature film, with a budget half of what it cost Disney to make Fox and the Hound, and $37 million less than it cost Disney to lose $22 million on The Black Cauldron. Secret of Nim was rated G, which was actually a surprise. Bluth Bluth and Goldman hoped that they would get a PG due to the intense scenes and mature themes. They wanted to draw a slightly older audience than Disney usually catered to. As part of the marketing effort in January of 1982, ahead of NIMS July release, a magazine-style newsletter was published to support the film. It featured provocative call-outs heralding Don Bluth Productions and The Secret of NIM as the beginning of the second age of animation. In a vacuum, Secret of NIM may have dominated the box office when it opened in July of 1982. Unfortunately, Disney was highly protective of its place as the leader in domestic feature film animation production and also petty and vindictive. NIM would be facing competition and manipulation of the playing field. Disney was ready to unleash their own second age of animation with the futuristic CG spectacle Tron, in which they had invested nearly $20 million. Disney flexed their industry might by preventing theaters from showing Tron and Secret of Nim as a double feature. 
NIM would also find itself hamstrung by a change in ownership at distribution partner United Artists. In 1981, Tracinda Corp purchased United Artists and merged it with MGM, creating MGM UA. Like most ownership changes in Hollywood, the new boss wasn't as invested in the previous boss's projects. That meant Aurora was stuck with the cost of marketing the film and they didn't have the kind of money that Disney had. Initially, Aurora and Bluth thought NIM would be in 1,000 theaters when it opened, but without top-tier support from MGM UA, it only opened in 100. To make matters worse, E.T. the Extraterrestrial opened in June and was in 1,300 theaters. We here, in the future, know that it was one of the most successful and beloved films of all time, literally becoming the number one top-grossing film of all time as of 1982. That certainly hurt NIM's visibility. Ability. But it didn't kill it. In the theaters where it screened, Nim placed third overall, taking out other competitors like Rocky III and Star Trek II. Its initial performance was good enough to get it into more theaters and it picked up momentum over the next few weeks, eventually climbing to over 700 locations. After a month in theaters, it had made over $5 million, which was good, but wasn't a profit. It was shy of Tron's $20 million, and it paled in comparison to E.T.'s $150 million. Secret of Nim would leave theaters after making just shy of $15 million in the U.S. Siskel and Ebert, the go-to movie reviewers at the time, weighed in on the clash of the animation studios, Disney's Tron and Don Bluth's Secret of Nim, calling one a showcase of old Disney and the other a look at the new Disney. Unfortunately, in their eyes, Don Bluth Studios was the old Disney and Tron was the new Disney. Technically, yes, exactly what Bluth was hoping to achieve, a preservation of the old ways, but also disappointing because he thought that was also the way of the future. Once this little timid mouse is placed in, in genuine peril and this whole society of, of rats and their various personalities, including a ruthless would-be leader, then I thought the picture really took off and did give me some of the magic of the old Disney film. One of the things it had that a lot of recent animated films have not have had, I think, was depth. Music for The Secret of Nim was composed by Jerry Goldsmith of Alien and Star Trek The Motion Picture fame. The Secret of Nim was Goldsmith's first animated feature. The album was released in July of 1982 as part of the marketing for The Secret of Nim. Other merchandise included lunchboxes, puzzles, storybooks, coloring and activity books, calendars, plush dolls, a board game, and a press-out playset from Whitman. The Secret of Nim was released on Super 8, VHS, Betamax, CED, Video Disc, Video 8, and Laserdisc in 1983 in the US and around the world. The home market would make up the difference in the budget, eventually putting Nim into the profit zone. In 1990, it was re-released on VHS and Laserdisc, expanding the audience for the film as it found a new generation of fans. In 1994, it was re-released as a Philips CDI video disc and again on VHS, leaving no format untouched. It came home on DVD in 1998. In 2007, Don Bluth and Gary Goldman helped produce a high-def restoration as part of a two-disc set. The Blu-ray was released in 2011. Secret of Nim 2, Timmy to the Rescue. <laughs> I got electric boogaloo stuck in my head. <laughs> Secret of Nim 2, Timmy to the Rescue, was released direct to video in 1998 with absolutely no input or involvement from Don Bluth. Dom DeLuise returns as Jeremy the Crow alongside new cast members like Ralph Macchio, Eric Idle, Meshach Taylor, William H. Macy, Peter McNichol, Kevin Michael Richardson, and Harvey Corman. An original story ignoring the events of 1986's Raxo and the Rats of Nim, the sequel to the original book, the question is, is it canon? No, to the degree that it matters to anyone anywhere. There's not a lot of noise in the Secret of Nim cinematic universe community. Not a lot of opinions about the value of Raxo's place in the Nimverse. That said, in 2009, Paramount Pictures was working with director Neil Berger on a potential remake of The Secret of Nim. When that didn't happen, in 2015, MGM picked up the rights with the intent to produce a new CGI slash live action movie based on the original book, Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim. Or something. It was described as, quote, an origin story in which an imperiled mouse protagonist befriends a comical crew of lab rats as they turn hyper intelligent. They escape a secret laboratory and become the great minds of vermin civilization, forced to outwit the humans hot on their tails. If you like 2007's Alvin and the Chipmunks, this sounds like it would have been right up your alley. In 2019, the Russo brothers were announced as the executive producers of another attempted remake. Deadline reported in 2021 that the latest activity seemed to be pointing in the direction of a television series based on the books in development at Fox. The project is, quote, based on the books rather than the Secret of Nim animated movie directed by Don Bluth that came out in 1982. It is the latest attempt to reboot the story with the likes of Neil Berger, Michael Berg, and the Russo brothers previously attached to turn it into a feature film. I don't have the milk of mother's kindness in me anymore. Yeah. That udder's been dry for a while though, hasn't it? 
After The Secret of Nim, Don Bluth Studios went on to produce the animation for both video games Dragon's Lair in 1983 and Space Ace in 1984, followed by several more movies including An American Tale in 1986, The Land Before Time in 1988, and All Dogs Go to Heaven in 1989. Secret of Nim ultimately achieved its goal of keeping the old ways alive, injecting magic and fantasy into a story that was already an award-winning important piece of fiction, and pushing back against a juggernaut in the animation industry nearly causing its demise. Despite struggling to find its audience amidst a world wind of bigger budgets and genius filmmakers delivering once-in-a-lifetime films, it became a financial success thanks to international and home video sales. In the parlance of today's metrics, it is considered 93% fresh on Rotten Tomatoes. Inspired by science imbued with the wisdom of the old masters, bearing the heart of a team passionate about the art form above all else, The Secret of Nim was about being true to the story, the characters, and the art form, a secret Don Bluth shared with as many people as he could. Thanks for watching. Please hit like, hit subscribe if you're not already a subscriber. Thank you very much to those of you who already are. Please check out our brand new merch store at beanscannon.com. Buy some t-shirts if you're in the position to help the channel grow. If you would like early access to videos ad-free, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com slash toygalaxy. Let us know in the comments down below if you prefer the book version of The Rats of Nim or the movie version. I'll be honest, I did my book report in fourth grade and then haven't thought much about it since. Heck, I didn't think much about it when I wrote the book report. I'm sure my teacher knew I was full of crap when I went on for 300 words about the power of O'Brien's opening paragraph. Finished that thing on the bus that morning really foreshadowed what we're doing here <laughs> on this show. Who's not living up to their full potential now, Mrs. Richard? She's probably dead. <laughs> She's definitely not watching. Cut! <laughs>